Uh, but my name is Maria Molina, and um, like you heard, I work at NCAR, so this is based in Boulder, Colorado. And I want to acknowledge my co-authors, uh, especially Yaga Richter and Sasha Glanville, who have really helped me spin up on this topic of subseasonal prediction. So subseasonal refers to a time span of about weeks three to six. And so we're trying to predict about three to six weeks into the future. Uh, and so that's what we are referring to when we say subseasonal. And in this project, we're focusing on uh, prediction of precipitation across the globe. But some of the examples that I'll also be sharing are either specific to the US or also considering temperature. Um, and Katie Dagan is also here. Uh, so she's also a part of this project. And I also want to acknowledge Judith Berner, who's on Zoom. Uh, Judith coordinated a group of us to actually go ahead and work on global prediction of precipitation. So originally, that was not my scope. Um, and it's actually really pushed our work um, in a different direction that has been very exciting. And Anisha is also a part of that project. So I'll be sharing some very preliminary results. And uh, this is all work in progress. So I would also appreciate any uh, feedback, any suggestions for improvement or concerns. Yeah, but we are here today because uh, there's been a lot of progress in machine learning and specifically in deep learning, right? So we know that machine learning was uh, really defined back in the 1950s. It's been around for quite some time. This is not something new. There's been several advances over the years. Uh, but recently with GPUs, with the development of very large, high quality data sets that are labeled for supervised learning, which was defined in an earlier talk, uh, we've really seen a lot of advances also in deep learning. Uh, and some of these have also helped us in the earth sciences. And um, my topic of focus um, is within the scope of earth system uh, prediction or earth system modeling. And so this is spinning up a numerical model that has physical equations with some sort of initial conditions. And this goes into the future. Uh, and so we can fit machine learning in, in different steps of that process, right? So we can actually use machine learning uh, before we initialize this numerical model. And in that case, we could, for example, use machine learning to potentially um, improve or quality control our initial conditions that we'll use to run that numerical model. And so here I have an example paper that was recently published, actually this year, in um, JTAC. So this is an AMS journal on deep learning for um, observation quality control of precipitation over mountainous terrain. We can also use machine learning or deep learning while a numerical model is running. Uh, so for example, we could train or improve our physical parameterizations within that numerical model. And we can also reduce the uh, cost within high performance computing uh, by replacing certain model components. Uh, you just heard Dorit talk about the community earth system model, a uh, very complicated model, many different components between the ocean, the earth, the land, and the atmosphere. Uh, so potentially replacing certain components or even parameterizations within uh, these components, we can reduce the cost of running these um, simulations. And so here I have a paper that was recently published by uh, members of NCAR. And um, this was for machine learning for uh, the warm rain process and also had to do with um, cloud, clouds. And then we can also use machine learning once the numerical model has finished running. Right, so we have our numerical model output, different variables of interest. We can take those variables and then uh, further uh, post-process our data. We can perform additional predictions. Uh, we can do knowledge guided or, or uh, extract knowledge from that data uh, and even detect features. So Katie will be talking late, later during this uh, workshop later in the week on detecting atmospheric rivers and tropical cyclones from some of this output of numerical models. Uh, and here I'm providing an example where I trained a deep learning model, just a convolutional neural network, to classify severe convective storms. And so the work I'll be sharing today has to do with uh, that third and, and last example. So applying deep learning 
two numerical model output. Uh, and the numerical model simulations that I'll be talking about today or, or using uh, in the studies that I'm sharing with you were created using the community Earth system model, so the model that uh, Dorit just shared with you. And um, we know that this model, we use this model to generate some of these sub-seasonal predictions. So we go three to six weeks into the future, and we look at what precipitation and what temperature looks like. But doing that is really challenging. Uh, there's a lot of spread in the output over time, uh, and the source of predictability uh, also becomes an issue. So when we spin up the model during the first few days, so numerical weather prediction, a lot of that still comes from the initial conditions. But then over time, there are systematic model errors that seep in, and then we see our simulation drift from uh, observations, and then we really start to get predictability from uh, other components in the Earth system. And at longer time scales, you get a lot of your predictability from the ocean or features such as El Nino and La Nina through teleconnections. Uh, and so the simulations that I'm using here are created using CESM2, so again, the Community Earth System Model, version two, and the sub-seasonal reforecasts uh, follow SubEx protocol and are actually contributing uh, in real time or very near real time to an ongoing experiment, uh, and, and it contributes to a multi-model ensemble mean. So how skillful is CESM2 at these temperature and precipitation predictions three to six weeks into the future. Uh, well, here we have some bar plots. On the left-hand side, uh, you're looking at winter. Uh, the skill of CESM2 and several other versions of the model um, at predicting uh, temperature over land. And so on the y-axis is the anomaly correlation um, coefficient. And weeks three, four, you have skill of about 0.3, which is actually pretty good uh, at that lead time. And of course, it degrades as you head into weeks five and six. But when you take a look at precipitation, the skill is much lower. So you're looking at about 0.1 anomaly correlation coefficient and degrades even further as you head into weeks five and six. And so this, uh, the motivation behind my work is to try to move the needle a little bit. Right, so try to improve that skill a bit between weeks three, four, and also five and six. And we care about this because precipitation pre uh, predictions are really important for planning, right? So in extremes, that would really help emergency uh, managers. Uh, that would also help with water resource planning. And, um, and yeah, and so it just really helps um, the, from a societal standpoint, can be very beneficial. So there's a few different ways to think about the using machine learning for sub-seasonal prediction, right, or improving uh, these forecasts. So here on the x-axis, I have time. So on the left-hand side is time zero, and then we're going forward in time. Uh, so the first approach would be this diagonal line where we start with some observations or some initial conditions, so time zero, then apply machine learning, some sort of model, and then end up with an improved S2S or sub-seasonal forecast um, that hopefully has more skill than a numerical model. Or you can take a second approach, which is that vertical line, where you start at weeks three through six with your numerical model output, and bias correct or improve upon uh, that numerical model output and generate an improved prediction. And so I'll be sharing examples for each of these approaches here. So first starting with the diagonal line. So again, starting at uh, time zero and then applying machine learning and going into the future to generate a forecast that hopefully has some sort of skill. And I was really motivated by some work that has already been published uh, and is available in the literature. And uh, some of this past work that I found in um, Monthly Weather Review ended up identifying, using K-means clustering, uh, some weather regimes, right? So they took weather fields over the United States and generated some weather regimes, large-scale patterns, synoptic scale flow, 
of features that would tend to produce some sort of precipitation or temperature uh, field over the US. And so I decided to take a similar approach. Uh, and my objective here was not only to predict these weather regimes on a subseasonal uh, lead time, but to also try to identify where predictability was coming from. And so I took a two-step approach. The first step was to generate these weather regimes. And so here I ended up using self-organizing maps. Uh, so this is an artificial neural network. It's been around for quite some time. Um, and in an unsupervised way, generated these weather regimes over the US. And here I'm using five different fields. Uh, we're using UNV winds at 850 and 500 um, hectopascal, uh, and also using precipitation anomalies. And essentially all we're looking at here is a three by three self-organizing map after much testing and tuning uh, to determine the optimal hyperparameters and uh, spatial lattice, uh, but ended up with uh, different nodes that looked like they represented um, unique um, weather regimes over the US. And what's neat about self-organizing maps is that we also have transitional nodes, right? So between one uh, weather pattern and another, we kind of see that transition occurring. And that was something that I found desirable uh, for the next step. Um, but before I get there, I just wanted to highlight some other uh, ways we can use self-organizing maps. Right, so we can generate these maps and composites for each one of these neurons. And here you're looking at geopotential height anomalies at 500 hectopascal, and you see very different patterns. I also went ahead and computed extreme precipitation and just counted how many times extreme precipitation occurred in each one of those neurons or nodes and went ahead and bent them and tried to see if there was any sort of trend in any one of these weather regimes over time. I did not see that, <laughs> but I did see some clustering in space, which was interesting. Uh, so we can also see temporal uh, clusters. Uh, and so really the second approach, and I'm currently paused here at this step in my workflow and I need to get back to work to finish this. But the approach that I've been using so far is I went ahead and created this, uh, these different classes or weather regimes over the US. And for our machine learning workflow, we're gonna train a neural network and have done some initial training, but much more to be done. Inputted a field at week one. So here we have outgoing long wave radiation across a tropical region. Um, and so we have tropical latitudes. And here, thinking about the Madden-Julian oscillation, which we know through teleconnections can contribute to certain patterns over the US. And so starting with week one there, this gets fed into this artificial neural network, and then we predict one of these uh, weather regime classes. And so this doesn't exactly give us a forecast for precipitation at week three to six for one pinpoint location over the US, but we do get to at least get some information, which is um, what will the large scale pattern look like during that time period. And perhaps more interesting, the real objective in taking this type of approach is what follows. So after training, our goal is to then apply explainable AI methods, uh, like using saliency maps or layer wise relevance propagation, and then look back at that input field and see where predictability is coming from. So that was really the motivation here with this, uh, with setting up the workflow like this. And so now I'll show uh, the second approach, but I don't know if I should pause for questions or I can just keep going. Keep going, I'll keep going. Okay, just interrupt me if you have a question. Uh, and so now for our second approach. Um, oh, okay, go ahead, sorry. Do you use the full OL, OLR field or do you filter the OLR field to capture just the MJO part of the convective signal? Yeah, great question. So yeah, so there was pre-processing done to this OLR field. These are anomalies. Um, and here I have a lead time bias corrected anomaly. So this is actually CESM. And so another question was, well, here we're using CESM. Is there any initialization shock? Uh, the 
overall consensus was that generally no, that shouldn't be an issue, but really we should also be using uh, the product, the observational product that was used to initialize CESM. So in this case, I think that was CFS V2, and I don't remember what CFS stands for. Maybe you do. Climate, the climate. It's the NCEP, the climate forecasting system. Okay. Um, also, following up on this, you know, you're using a delta function for each one of your um, specific regimes. So you're allowing, you're predicting one and none of the others. And the question would be why not um, predict weights, you know? Yeah, great question. So I'm predicting. Um, so using softmax, we can generate a probability for each one of the classes. So in this example that I have on on the over on on the slide, you do have a sharp peak. But my hope is that we get some sort of distribution, right, and, and get some probabilities over different uh, regimes with each input field. And so that for me, my thinking is that hopefully we can then see uh, whether there's more confidence or less confidence in a certain weather regime over the US uh, based on some sort of input field. So yeah, that information would be really valuable to get um, some sort of probability for each one of the classes for input. Does that, okay, great. Judith has a question online. Hey Judith. Judith. Hi, hello. Thanks so much, this is really interesting. My question is, um, is this a classification problem? So when this MDO happens or this MDO signal in OLR, those are the different regimes and they're concurrent? Or are you asking the prediction problem, you know, like when you are in a certain phase, then you are in a certain weather regime uh, on the subseasonal time scale two or three weeks later? Thank you. Great question. Yeah. So it's a classification problem with some lead time. So yeah, that's a great way to put it, I think. Does that make sense, Judith? So are these weather regimes concurrent or are they two, two to three weeks later than your MJO signal? Yeah, it's, it has that two to three weeks later okay. or three weeks later or five, four weeks later, et cetera. Yeah, so after much. that MJO input. Thank you. Yep. Okay, great. So um, for the next approach, um, we're taking um, a look at this vertical approach here. So starting at weeks three, four, um, and or five, six, and then just improving upon that field that was output by the numerical model using deep learning. So in this case, that would be concurrent, like, yeah, same time frame. Um, and so for this approach, uh, initially, uh, we started using an observational product to use a supervised learning approach. Uh, and this, um, this observational product only had data points over land. Uh, so this is for those of you that um, um, are uh, knowledge or have a lot of domain expertise. Um, this is all, again, relatively new to me. But for those of you with domain expertise in subseasonal prediction, uh, a commonly used data set is the NOAA Climate Prediction Center uh, temperature and precipitation product, which really has data over land. Um, and an issue that that introduced uh, for me in machine learning or deep learning was that having um, no data over the oceans kind of limited me in terms of which deep learning approach I could take, right? So I couldn't really look at this from a convolutional uh, um, neural network approach. Uh, so that limited me. I did try uh, using um, that product and a convolutional neural network approach, but it, the model ended up just kind of learning the continents, which is not really particularly useful from a prediction standpoint. Um, but yeah, so, so I ended up looking for data products that had observational information over ocean and land. And so then I ended up uh, using these products that I'm going to share with you here. So here I'm using a different NOAA product uh, this is a blend of rain gauges and also uh, satellite information. Um, uh, again, I'm not an expert on the actual observational product or the way that the data was assimilated, uh, but this is ENOA GPCP product. And so this is what I'll be using for my labels as I try to uh, bias correct and improve our numerical model output. And so I'm using data from 1999 through 2020. 
Um, and here, I also wanted to predict temperature, so not just precipitation. And so for temperature, I had a bit more of a difficult time finding a product um, that uh, also had data over ocean that was in reanalysis. So I ended up uh, settling on a reanalysis product. So this is ERA5, so a product from ECMWF. And so the approach I ended up taking with uh, um, data that was, uh, that, that was on these images, uh, so we have our CESM model output, our numerical model output, and then our two observational products. And what I want to do is just input um, our CESM numerical model fields, and then as our labels to train upon, use our observational product. And I ended up settling on this unit architecture where, again, we start with our input on the left-hand side and then um, perform numerous convolutions and then um, output, um, try to move or nudge closer to the observational product. And here we're um, performing um, or using an architecture that's really similar to a paper published back in 2015 uh, so kind of like one of the more original unit architectures. Um, and the reasoning for using this sort of structure as a, or architecture as opposed to just a uh, traditional convolutional neural network was that I, kind of, I wanted that connection between the input and output in addition to the downsampling and upsampling. And when I trained without those cross connections, I ended up losing skill, which I thought was odd. But it turns out that having that large scale spatial structure uh, seems to be important. And so I need to go back and ask a bit more or dig deeper and really ask why. Um, because to me, before I did this, I thought having those cross connections wouldn't, wouldn't be um, advantageous in this approach. Because at times, some of these predictions from the numerical model could be quite off spatially from what really happened. Yet, having these cross connections really help with skill. Uh, and so again, just to be clear, in the input here, we have six different channels or, or fields. Uh, so our six variables that we're using as input include uh, weeks one, two, and three to predict week three. So we have a temporal component. And I also included the respective climatology for those weeks. And I actually did that at first kind of joking around because people would say that climatology has more skill than the numerical model. Um, and then I was like, well, maybe I should just feed that into this network and it turned out to help. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so what this network is getting as input is climatology. So what typically happens during that time of the year across the world. And then also what the numerical model thinks is going to happen on that respective week. So you have six input variables, and then you end up uh, predicting, in this case, uh, the error. And I'll explain what that means in a moment. And Judith, I will also try my best, but Judith can probably explain this better. Um, so the reason why I ended up predicting error instead of precipitation outright was that I, I came across an issue when I was trying to perform this supervised learning task. So for our numerical model output, we actually have numerous um, instances of that output. We have 11 ensemble members. So there are 11 predictions for the same time span. And usually taking the ensemble mean is how you would compute skill. But then if we use the label, take a look at the label for each one of those ensemble members, the network gets confused because it's going to bias correct this first instance and then looks at this and this is what it should be moving closer to. And then it looks at another ensemble member that looks different and yet it receives the same label. And so you can think about this, you know, if you have this 11 times, it makes it more difficult to converge to bias correct because these 11 ensemble members can look quite different at times. So what I ended up realizing was that what I could do is I could go ahead and actually subtract the CESM2 um, numerical field from the observational product. And if we take a look at this delta, this difference, 
each one of those deltas is different. So now they all have that unique label. And that actually really helped the network converge. And so now, instead of predicting precipitation outright, we're predicting this delta between the observational product and the numerical model output. And each one has a unique label that is relative to the input. And so this is what skill looks like for this um, global prediction of this delta between the observational product and the numerical product globally. The unit does predict over ocean points, but here I went ahead and masked those points because really we're interested in the prediction. Here I'm showing temperature. We're really interested in the prediction of temperature and precipitation over land uh, for societal reasons. Um, and so overall, when we take a look at skill, so this is just a Pearson correlation between the um, temperature error prediction and that true uh, difference between the temperature observation and the numerical model. And we see that skill is quite high in each one of these seasons across South America. We also have quite a bit of skill in certain regions during certain seasons. And that value that's next to each one of the season abbreviations is just the um, Pearson correlation coefficient. So this is what skill looks like for uh, week three precipitation. And so again, we're using weeks one, two, and three. So three temporal inputs into this unit. And this is a skill that it ends up with precipitation. So it's not as skillful as temperature, but nonetheless, we still have quite a bit of skill over certain areas. And so then the, the following question that I asked was, okay, so if we're doing a pretty good job at predicting these errors, can we just add them back to the numerical model to correct what it predicted, right? Well, it turns out we can get a little bit more skill, but not a whole lot. So the magnitude of the prediction from the unit is similar in sign. So it, it gener generally is in the di correct direction, um, but it, the magnitude is not large enough, at least right now. And I will also uh, say this is work that's in progress. I have not performed a extensive hyperparameter grid search. So, you know, that might change or there's something I'm not quite thinking in. I actually have an idea that I'll share with you uh, momentarily to improve that. Um, but yeah, so this is the current state of things. And overall, this looks the same for weeks three, weeks four, weeks five, and week six. But I don't want to bore you by showing you like, they're all, all the anomaly correlations are similar, which I also thought was interesting because even as you increase in lead time, um, you still can keep that skill. But I will also say um, what I ended up doing for, let's say, week six is I did have to include weeks one, two, three, four, five, and six. So the number of inputs also increases as we um, increase in lead time. If you don't do that and you just keep three input channels for the respective variable type, um, the skill does degrade. So we are adding more um, information as well to keep the skill consistent. Uh, so some future work and opportunities, um, you know, thinking into the future as I continue to perform this extensive hyperparameter grid search, hoping maybe to gain more skill or even if things remain consistent, uh, the question that I have is, okay, well, why? Why is this able, this unit able to predict um, this difference between the numerical model output and the observational product with such skill. And so I'm hoping to use some explainable AI methods uh, to then dig in a little bit deeper, to look at seasonal differences and try to better understand that. Um, and then also just a comparison to another baseline method, right? Um, and additionally, we really want to, actually with Katie, Katie and I currently have a proposal in an internal um, under that went under review uh, to generate a large ML-based ensemble uh, using a similar approach. And the thought is, well, if we make, we can actually use a similar approach 
tweak the weights when we initialize our unit training, for example, um, and generate a large ensemble of trained models to see how much spread there is in our solutions. And, and maybe someone has more insight on one that potentially would do here. Um, and then the other idea I had that I sort of alluded to is um, at this point, we are um, training, um, for, we're assessing our loss function is optimizing across all grid points. And so my thought is to go back and add weights to land points to make our network realize that it needs to perform more skill across land points, right? So that seems like a really simple and obvious thing to go back and do. Uh, because right now, if I were to show you the skill everywhere uh, across the tropical Pacific, where El Nino and La Nina occur, there's a lot of skill, right? So in places where we have um, lower uh, variability, at least less than, uh, well, more than, whatever. <laughs> so yeah, when, when variability occurs at a slower uh, frequency than, um, than the lead times we're looking at, of course, there's a lot of skill. And so we want our network to not really focus on those areas. Um, and then I have two slides left. Um, and so this was actually um, yesterday. So the benefit of in-person workshops is that we get to have dinner together and we get to interact. And so I had a really interesting conversation yesterday evening during dinner, which was uh, we we're just thinking about how certain, you know, climate change and how several um, several regions in the world are going to be more vulnerable to some of the impacts simply because of socioeconomic status, et cetera. Uh, and then it made me think about just ethics in AI more broadly, right? Because we're here to talk about AI and applying it for climate, ultimately because we want to make a positive impact. We're hoping that we can um, improve or make advances within our field. But uh, this tweet went viral. Uh, so this is this project and it's uh, available on GitHub fakes face depixelizer uh, and so we essentially have a coarser uh, resolution image on the left hand side many of us can recognize the person on the left hand side Barack Obama um, and so then this network when sees Barack Obama and generates a higher resolution image the person that comes out is the person on the right which is you know for us this is common this is we we can uh, make sense of this, but anyway, for this network, we see some bias come out. And then the concern is, you know, as we're using AI and we're feeding in data into our models, we're, we can possibly come across issues like that, right? Where socioeconomic information, racial information, et cetera, seeps into our models. And so we really need to think about ethics in AI for weather and climate applications. And so we actually have a project that was recently funded. The PI is Dr. Amy Yeboah from Howard University. Um, she applied for uh, the NCAR Innovator Program. And so I'm really honored to be working with her on this project along with several other NCAR scientists and also uh, some members from the NSF AI Institute uh, that's being led in University of Oklahoma. Uh, but we have Julie Demuth, who's a scientist at NCAR also working on this project. And so I have this image here. This is another Twitter, uh, another image that was shared on Twitter. Uh, and really what it showed was that if you looked at radar from the National Weather Service and its coverage across the southeastern US and where you have some gaps in its quality, happen to have those gaps happen to have pretty high spatial correlation with communities of black Americans, right? And so the question is here, like, are they being underserved by our National Weather Service product? Perhaps unintentionally, but again, this information does seep in. And so if we're potentially creating, let's say, a um, AI model that does prediction of severe convective storms using radar generated images, will we end up seeing some of these gaps in our AI models as well? And I don't know. It's just a question I posed. Um, but this is just one example. Like, how many more are there? 
And so I just end uh, with that, just to be careful. Thank you for the excellent talk and excellent work, Maria. Lord? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, fabulous talk. Thanks a lot. That was great. So one comment and one question. Yeah, so thank you for bringing this up about ethics and AI. I think it's an absolutely critical aspect. I'm, I'm really happy you bring this up. And as, as a follow-up, Amy McGovern was the lead uh, of the AI2ES Institute. Well, actually talk about ethics uh, uh, in AI on Thursday, I think. Yes, I think Thursday morning. So yeah, tune up. So yeah, thanks for that. Question for the more for the earlier part, I think. So so I know you haven't kind of done any tuning to hyperparameters and things like this, but I'd be almost tempted to say, you know, if you can't improve the skill, what does that mean? Is that the model is so good or it's that CSM is that good or is that that bad? Right? <laughs> Yeah, so I, I, I think, um, so I, again, sub-seasonal prediction is relatively new to me, from, but from other talks that I've watched on this topic, there's just, you know, mathematically, there's chaos in the system, and simply when you head into weeks three through six, you just, you just can't have, you just don't have skill anymore, right? There's too much chaos in the system, and I'm sure Judith can also uh, elaborate on that uh, much more eloquently than I can but simply that it's just really difficult. And the idea is that perhaps there are certain times or instances where there is predictability. And so people have really focused on forecasts of opportunity where there is some sort of teleconnection that's really pronounced, perhaps El Nino or Matt and Julian oscillation. And then during those instances, you could have predictability, but that you can't really have a lot of predictability year round Etc. And so, yeah, so, so another question here is I'm considering everything in an aggregate, right? I could also uh, parse this and look at times when El Nino was in a certain phase or the Madden Julian oscillation was in a certain phase and see this, these numbers change. Perhaps you, we do see greater improvement during certain instances. I don't know, but that, that's, uh, thanks for bringing that up. No, that's a great point. Yeah, thanks, thanks a lot. That, that's great stuff. Um, Julie had her hand up and maybe. Okay. <laughs> yeah, maybe Judith next and then speaking and then you. Um, yeah, um, yeah, so um, I just want to second what Maria is saying. Um, we, we're tackling a really difficult problem where the skill is near zero and for precipitation, the system might just not have subseasonal predictive skill at all due to chaos in the small scales. For temperature, we think um, it does. And then we're looking at week three precipitation. So there is probably some skill, but when it comes to week four or five, then we're, we're, we're going around zero in terms of skill. And the other aspect that that is um, sort of, is that what Maria is tackling here is to um, looking at the forecast problem in terms of teleconnections three weeks out, um, under, you know, sort of looking at teleconnections under chaotic growth um, and the model error problem at the same time. And part of this work was um, uh, was inspired by this uh, WMO AI challenge, the World Meteorological Organization Subseasonal to Seasonal AI Challenge, which, uh, which, which was formulated. However, going forward, I think it would make a lot of sense to disentangle the prediction problem from the model error problem. And the latter, we could disentangle by just using one ensemble member as the truth and looking at the remaining ensemble members at the model. Then we know, can learn something about prediction. And then the model error is sort of the second component, which then on the top of an unpredictable system will tell you something about the systematic differences between the model and the true trajectory. Thanks so much. Very nice talk, Maria. Thanks, Judith. And I'll also add another suggestion Judith actually had was to also uh, train just for week one um, to look at like the initialization error. And, and that could be something that we um, think about also moving forward. Great. Thanks, Judith. Stephen? Great. Uh, really interesting talk. Um, I was curious how you um, how you think about um, potentially overfitting or guarding against overfitting because data sets for subseasonal prediction are, are relatively small. 
Yeah, absolutely. So that was also what motivated our use of the 11 ensemble members without taking the mean, um, which can introduce other challenges, right? So typically we would predict or assess skill by taking the ensemble mean. Uh, but here I left each ensemble member on its own. And, um, and also the architecture here, I kind of skimmed over. Um, so that's kind of a way to address the sample size issue. So I just left the ensemble members in there. We do have different um, Hindcast sets from CESM. So we also have a, a Wacom version, so a high top version for the vertical resolution. Um, and then we also have CESM1 Hindcast. So my thinking was originally, if this was not enough, was to also incorporate some of those other um, Hindcasts. Uh, but at least in this case, with this architecture, there's also batch normalization that's happening here quite a few times after the double convolutions or within the double convolutions. Um, and so it seems to do okay when I do like the uh, training, validation, and, and then just leaving the evaluation set out. So at least it seems okay. Um, but I'm sure if I had a larger sample size, that maybe these um, skill scores could improve. Right, because yeah, as you said, it, it is a challenge. Even with the 11 ensemble members and that 20 something year span, it's not comparable to like ImageNet, right? Yeah. Does that help or answer? Oh. Hey, my turn. Um, I now have two questions, sorry. Uh, <laughs> the first one um, being about the inputs and whether or not you've, you've experimented with different inputs um, it's sort of a, you know, for me, I'm an oceanographer, so I think if you want to do S2S predictions, you know, include the ocean or different, more ocean variables or whatnot, um, especially in, in combination with you using LRPs um, to see where those, that skill might be coming from. Uh, my second question was more in terms of choosing a baseline for truth, which because we're now, you know, we've been invoking a chaotic system here, um, a few times. So if we choose a truth, then of course different areas are going to have very different Lapanyev exponents associated with them. So choosing that truth very carefully and perhaps not just pulling out an ensemble member could probably make a big, dif big difference or have a big impact on how you assess your, your skill to be developing. So there's one question, uh, a comment, I guess. Great, um, thank you so much. Um, yeah, so for the input fields for the first approach, um, really thinking about focusing on um, SSTs across the tropical Pacific for representing El Nino and La Nina, or just Enzo in general, Enzo State. Um, and, um, and I really wanted to leave this, uh, leave the spatial field in there, right? So not um, computing a Nino index or MJO index. I wanted the full spatial fields. And the reasoning for that was that we have different types of El Nino and La Nina, different types of you know, MJO as it propagates. It can do that at different speeds, et cetera. And so I, I, want, I, I want that spatial field uh, to be the input. Um, and really just focusing on outgoing long wave radiation uh, for the Madden Julian oscillation representation and also SSTs for El Nino and La Nina, just based on domain knowledge. Um, also incorporating things like zonal wind, again, for um, MJO, and, uh, and yeah, and really relying heavily on physical scientists and, and their expertise on uh, this prediction problem uh, to determine those input fields. Did you? Sorry. Um, we're also almost out of time, so we could continue this discussion, I guess, over uh, dinner. <laughs> because we are in person. Hey. Um, so in terms of using using Enzo, for example, I mean, there's some things like, you know, the slower things like the equatorial undercurrent and, and you know, um, the, the Ekman uh, impacts of, of how that equatorial undercurrent is, is you know, gaining its, its variability or whatnot. So in that sense, you know, using just the sea surface temperature could potentially not be the best thing. Great point. Yeah, thinking about think, not just the thin layer of the ocean that's touching the atmosphere. Oh, and then for your second question, I, uh, I can't, we can just talk later. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Annalisa has the final question. Ah, final question of the day. Um, it, it's almost a curiosity. Uh, if we are assuming that the problem is the chaoticity of the system, why we are even uh, 
trying to work on that problem, except that, yes, I mean, we, we are interested in predicting precipitation, but if we cannot do it, we cannot do it. Um, I was a little bit surprised to see a scale that was that low at three, four weeks. Is that common? I mean, is, is there a model that does a little bit better, or is this pretty much the maximum scale that we can hope on precipitation at three weeks? Yeah, my understanding is that ECMWF is better. <laughs> But, but it's not free. Um, so yeah, it's, it's just a challenge. And I think, um, I guess pushing back a little bit is, it's just that the potential gains that we have for society are so great, right? Like, why not try? Like, yeah. And, and, and even if it's not, if we can't gain skill all the time, identify those times that we can gain skill. Um, or, or perhaps even for extreme events. Right, the, the repercussions for those events are just so, so immense. Um, yeah, so that, that's me pushing back to your comment. <laughs> no, yeah. Great, awesome. Yeah, thanks everyone for staying on and thank you, Maria.